Hello, hello, this is Irene with Soga Talks. Thank you for tuning in. This is to loyal, loyal followers. All right, we are on LinkedIn, we're on X, we're on YouTube. I love chatting with fascinating people in tech here in Soga Talk Studio. So please support us. And all we ask is just your opinion, is your like, is your share with your network, with your colleagues, with the world. So today is my day because Max Simonovsky is with me here. Max, how are you? It's all great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's my pleasure because I'm so impressed with your background, okay? With your entrepreneurial journey, with your thought leadership presence as AI technology expert. So today we said we're going to talk about AI, the pitfalls, what's up now with AI and generally, yeah, let's talk a little bit. What excites you right now in the large and evolving landscape of AI technology? I think everything is exciting, right? Um, it, we, we are on an edge of one of the most exciting and probably unique revolutions. And I think um, one of the reasons why it's, it's really exciting me is in the previous revolutions that we had, you could pretty easily predict where it go, right? What kind of things are going to happen right now? I, I don't think we can really predict. We can assume some of the things we can maybe envision what is going to happen in the next maybe year, maybe two years. We can't really predict the future in the 50 years ahead. Uh, even the science fiction books that I was um, reading when I was a kid, they are not even envisioning slightly what is going to happen. And this is unbelievable, exciting um, to be part of that and live in that time. Good times. Good times to be alive for sure, Max. So could you please share your view, your opinion in AI in healthcare? AI in healthcare is not new, right? We, we have AI in healthcare. We, we never called it AI. We called it sometimes business intelligence, sometimes scientific intelligence, we called it uh, deep statistics and deep information, uh, understanding on informatics. Um, we had technologies that helped us to predict molecule sizes and shapes and, and substitutes and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. If you look at pharmaceuticals, they're using AI technologies for many years. Um, they just didn't call it AI as we call it today. I, I think uh, was understanding that um, the way medical and healthcare organizations in general looking into AI is very different from uh, the common public is looking into AI um, because they're already using it for many years. I think right now, um, the exciting part of it is that we can see more and more practical uses of AI in the front line, right in front of the patient. And this is unbelievable. You see robotics that is operated um, partially by AI, partially by human beings. You see tools that can understand um, uh, the different patient data way better than a regular human being can. And if you take that into the research environment of health and medical um, organization, this is unbelievable what's going on over there. It, it, just think about it. I need thousands of people to, un to, to create a, a real medical scientific use case that then I can use as a, as a basis for new treatment, for new procedure. Right now, using AI, you can achieve all of that within a fraction of time that we had or that we needed before. And this is unbelievable. That means that we can push medical innovation way faster way, way faster. I'm talking about fractions of years compared to what it was before. And that means that all of us will get better healthcare, more achievable and way faster than it was. So for me, this is um, like if I compare that to other industries, the impact of AI on healthcare is way greater than on any other industry that you can think of right now. Fascinating, fascinating, absolutely. And if we combine AI and IoT, okay, where do you see these opportunities for smarter, efficient solutions in healthcare or beyond manufacturing or anywhere else? AI and IoT, how will that play out? Well, uh, it, it's a great question. It's a, 
if you think about IoT in general, IoT is is not a revolution anymore. It's a day to day thing. We are living within an IoT environment. It's like that's what it is, and we are doing that for many years. Um, right now, what's interesting is that the volume of information that the IoT devices that uh, are incorporated and integrated in almost every aspect of our life, collecting and recording is um, in such great magnitude that a regular human being cannot really understand um, how much benefits that means. With AI technologies, technology that can really take all of that data, analyze, and not just understand what that means, but actually use that to predict and improve processes is, un- is, is great. The, like one of, the, one of the simple examples, and you mentioned safety, um, and I'll take it to production right now. You, you see IoT devices in production facilities from uh, mechanical production facilities up to liquid pharmaceuticals and everything that is in between. You see IoT devices coupled with AIs that can really understand how to improve process in real time with humans and with robots integrated into the same production place. So you can understand and get insights of, okay, let's improve compressor pressure in this area. Let's bring one more human being into that process or the opposite. Let's take that robot out or robot in um, and you can improve the efficiency of that process by dozens of percents immediately. And that means cost effectiveness. That means that the product at the end of the process costs less in production, which means it should cost less to the end consumer. And if you add that to the medical devices that are produced today, that means that medical devices cost less. That means that the treatment using those medical devices are more efficient. Et cetera, et cetera. So it's a crazy cascading landscape that empowers almost every single process that you can think of. And AI is pushing all of that faster and more efficiently. Right. What about addressing some of the pitfalls? Okay, because what I hear, and I'm sure you're aware, because it's all over my LinkedIn feed, it's all over Twitter, everywhere else, right? Data privacy, security, right? Consumers concerned, government concerns, right? So are we moving in the right direction? Well, I'm not sure that I can really answer that question in a very knowledgeable <laughs> way, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. I, can, I can maybe uh, think of two scenarios. One is I'm a paranoid person and, and, and I think that my data privacy is uh, compromised. Um, and then I will probably go into... A, a, a common sense. Well, if I'm not doing anything wrong and I'm not doing anything illegal, why should I care? Right? If 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 I'm if there is nothing that I ca- I should hide and if all what I'm doing is being a normal citizen of this country or any country that I live in, pay my taxes, uh play according to the real rules over here, um then my data stored by the government or other parties is not really treating me or not putting me at risk, right? If I am doing things wrong, then whatever cybersecurity I have, probably it will not help me, right? So uh, what I'm trying to say is if someone wants to play with your data, they will find a way to do it. Okay, and you as an individual probably will not have tools to protect yourself properly. Um, if you use a third service, cybersecurity company that protects you, well, they protect you, but at the same time, they ex- you expose to them, right? So again, it's going back to a simple question: uh, Are you are you doing something that you should hide? And if yes, then think again. Uh, if not, then you should not really be concerned about any of that. Um, That's a simple rule, you know. Yep. Don't, don't do things that are illegal. Very simple. I don't get do things it. that are illegal. I get it, Max. Thank you. So let's talk about some, you know, limitations and challenges, though. Okay, because company facing yeah, implementation projects, initiatives, right? With all the rara, with all the excitement going on in the business community, in technology community, right? Let's talk about some real limitations and maybe some advices we should give to leaders who are embarking on the journey today. 
That's that's an interesting question. It's also linked pretty well to the previous question uh, on the cybersecurity. And I'll, I'll, I'll probably also elaborate a bit more. There is a variety of very interesting companies that are helping with the cybersecurity and AI related questions. And there is a lot of questions in that um, space. And if I think about the, the what you know what can be or cannot be done, and what leaders should think of, if you're not trying to understand and learn the, the AI related capabilities, and you're not integrated that in integrating that in real time into your business, into your processes, you're probably going to be um, not running fast enough. As, as the market is speeding up on every single day. So all of the small companies that years ago had no, not enough human resources or not enough talent to compete with the big guys, right now the AI helped them to do it. Um, that's true for um, storing the data. That's true for processing the data. That's due for being more efficient. That, that's true for charging less, but being more profitable. Um, it's it's something to understand and to look around. And I see many of my colleagues, entrepreneurs and founders of companies, they shrink their human resources sometimes by 50%, but the company is not losing on their efficiency. Um, so on one side, it's not nice to re release people, but at the same time, the company continue to operate and sometimes even better than they were before. Um, so things to think of and about is you should definitely look into processes that you can improve in terms of speeding them up. And that's even, you know, customer relationship, it's sales processes, marketing, it's being creative, uh, even in inventing things. All of that can be definitely improved. Um, I'll probably say something that you, most of the people here heard from someone and Elon Musk is pretty uh, repeating that. Uh, try to understand your process, eliminate whatever you have that is not really needed, and then improve, implement, improve, implement, right? So it's pretty much the same thing. The AI tools right now give, give us or giving us the capabilities mm -hmm. to do it pretty well. And that's amazing. Truly, truly amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's talk now about, you know, those who are uh, implementing and looking to scale up, okay, uh, AI solution. I know you probably tell me AI technology is no different from any other tech, any other platform, companies implementing and looking, right, to improve their operations, to improve their processes, like you said, right? But is there any specifics, okay, you want to share with the world today in a, in a way that what are the, like, good tips for scaling this solution and not, again, leading to catastrophic, again, disasters we sort of all envisioned, right? I think that one way to look at that is, and I'm old enough to remember that, and, um, you know, we had the digital revolution and a great example of that. Finances were all done on paper. Some companies and agencies are still doing that. And then we suddenly moved to Excel. There was a beautiful commercial from Microsoft about that Excel in an elevator, how you prepare uh, a report in like a few seconds. And we had, we had that revolution, which was very, very painful. It still is because some companies are still going through that process of taking um, hard copies, scanning them, trying to you know make them digital. Um, but the thing is that those companies who has not went through that digital conversion, they stayed behind. Um, and those who did it very fast and very efficient, they combined two, usually two positions within that conversion. One who was very young and visionary and, and did implementation very fast, usually coming from an operation process background. So uh, they became great CEOs at some point. And uh, the visionary managers who usually play CEO roles, who understand that it is painful right now, but right behind the corner, there is an amazing opportunity of having a more efficient and more cost-effective company. So to your question on specific practices, um, never start a big change immediately, right? Um, 
it's always a process. And under, first of all, you need to make sure that the culture of the company is behind that vision. So create a vision plan, share it with your team, share it with the entire company, make sure everyone buys into that and will not be those who will create those bottlenecks of not implementing that plan. As soon as everyone on, the, on board, start the implementation um, and just increase that, increase, increase, increase until it's done. The moment it's done, you are one of the first runners. So you're more efficient than everyone else. I, I hope that makes sense that a bit, uh, maybe a vague answer. Um, but for me, I, I was one of, I think, first users of ChatGPT-like solutions. Uh, and I remember when it, it came uh, viral around the globe and everyone was speaking about it. And I was like, well, I'm using that for like uh, enough time to say that it's, it's great, but let's talk about how you can copy that idea into practical tools and not just, okay, create me a post on LinkedIn, right? Uh, let's build strategies with that. So to, to summarize that answer, I think uh, you should have a plan for any change. And definitely when it was in a revolution like what we are having right now, if that's not part of your company vision for the next future, I would say not even the year, but all your future vision, it will be very hard to compete for you with everyone else. It will be just almost impossible. So my advice, start yesterday. That's my advice. Start Sounds yesterday. doable. You, Sounds you completely play. doable. Yep. yep. Easy to do. Thanks. Yeah. Check. Just Good one. Go back in time and start. That's pretty exactly. much what it is. Exactly. Beautiful. Yeah. That's why I love talking to experts. Okay. They send you to your better younger self and that just works every time. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. You touched on chat GPT. Okay. I was kind of thinking, should we touch generative AI? Should we just talk about fun? Or with serious person like yourself, experienced person like yourself, what's your lesson learned for really business leaders, okay? Because this is business talk. It's not fun content that we're all fascinated with. And even about content, are learning more and more that it takes teams, it takes people, it takes money to create this fabulous, easy to watch Gen AI content, don't you think? So what about business people? How can they be more productive and more efficient with implementing this? Well, there are so many opportunities of utilizing those kind of tools. And this is from being more productive with how you, you know, write your emails and, and being more precise, more effective up to being really smart on creating strategic plans for market penetration. Um, just making the market research today is way easier than it was before. You don't need the giant companies that will do it for you and charge you crazy money. Um, you can get real insights in real time. The beauty of it that you don't need that market research. Right? Well, no, it's not that you don't need, but the thing is that before you would spend money for market research, you'll do it maybe once a year and then you plan accordingly. Right now you can do it every day. So every, every month you can make a small market research and understand what's happening and you can make decisions accordingly. So you can adjust your annual operation plan and make it on one side solid, but at the same time flexible enough to adjust your operations to the market needs. And you can understand those market needs way better. So that means you can have a way better value offer. Um, you can have a way better understanding of what the client really needs. Uh, and if that if the product that you have or the services that you have really solve those needs, um, so on on your question, what that means for business leaders, um, I think um, you can be a way more efficient business leader using AI tools. And the first and for all, it can help you analyzing what things you're not good in, and then you can improve those things. And you can improve those things by what we used to do before, hire the right talent um, and let them help you doing those things properly. And now you can hire an AI and help you do those things properly. 
So you can enjoy both worlds. You can bring talent and you can improve yourself as well using an AI. Think of that as a non-invasive resource that can give you a real feedback in real time, suggest you how to improve. And the only thing that you need to do is be open-minded to that and let it help you. So my next topic for you, Max, is about innovators. Okay, what about those who really implementing AI right now in their product service. startups, their mid-sized companies, their large big tech companies, they all kind of all sprinting towards that beautiful future, right? We're all part of. So any advice there, your learnings, your experience in that area? It's hard right now to be an innovator. And and it's hard. Well, it's not that it's it's hard. It's way different than it was before because before whatever idea you had, you kind of had time to implement it. It's not that you had a lot of time, but you had time to research, investigate, try, and then implement it. With, um, with the, 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 the merge of AI that is speeding up every single day and improving itself way faster than we as humans can, you don't have enough time right now. So you're in a competition with something that is running way faster than you thinking faster than you can at some point imagine things faster than you. So if before, when you were thinking about an, an amazing, creative innovator, you were saying he's living 10 years ahead, right? Or 20 years ahead in his like imaginary future. I think right now you need to be 50 years ahead in your thinking. Um, you can't use the AI tools that you have available right now in the market to innovate because until you finish the innovate, those tools are outdated and you have a way better tool. So whatever innovation you have based on those tools, that's not an innovation anymore. So a simple example, if you have chat GPT 4.0 right now, and you think that you're going to use that to create an innovation, you're losing the market just by even having that thought. You need to think of chat GPT 7 and what that can do and how you can use that for your innovation, right? Because whatever, whatever that is, if it's going to be based on those tools, you already, you already finished late than anyone else. So you need to live way ahead in the future. And, and, and when I'm saying that, that's hard. And it's hard because of the first question you had. Um, we can't really predict how that future is going to look like have some very vague assumptions, um, but nothing really solid like we had before during the other revolutions. Now it's so hard to understand where this is going to go. And there is some people that really, you know, uh, having amazing pay salaries to try and understand where this is going. And you have great teams in, in the big corporates, you know, in the Mac 7 that are trying to envision where this is going to go. But even them, they have some assumptions, some understandings, but they don't have any solid of what's going to happen in 10 years. We know things that will happen in 10 years, but we can't really understand the market landscape in 10 years in, in a solid way. So being an innovator and envisioning that 10 years ahead is going to be very hard. Right? You need to have a very creative mind, very visionary mind, and I'll probably reference Albert Einstein into that. Um, a real intelligence coming from your imagination. Make sure you have good imagination because you need to imagine something that is just out of this world and make sure it's feasible. I don't know if we are trying to make a human AI. I think it's, there is no sense in it, to be honest. I think it's, it's going to be something different and trying to humanize that. It's Maybe a philosophical question. I'm not sure if it's the right philosophical question. It's probably a philosophical question because we fear from a different intelligence than a human intelligence. And the reason why we fear from that is because we will probably not understand and everything that we don't understand, we fear from. That's just the simple human survival, uh, evolutional uh, basis of how our brain works. And, and that there is, make, there is a lot of sense in it. I. 
to make an intelligence and artificial intelligence think like humans, that means we need to raise it as a human being. So we need to raise a kid that is thinking way faster than any human being and expect that kid to think slow like us and have an intelligence like us. I think it's on, on by the basis is almost impossible to, to expect something like that to happen. Um, at the same time, the question is, we are still building it. So we are still kind of helping that intelligence to mature and we can help it mature to support us or to think that we are not good enough for that. And one of the, one of the fun examples that I saw about it, um, you have those very intelligent people that say, it's hard for me to be around kids because we communicate on different levels, right? Some people say it's boring for me to be around little kids because there is nothing interesting that we can discuss together. If you have a technology or an AI that thinks faster and I don't, I, I, I don't know if we can say better, but differently from what we are, the question is, will it be bored communicating with us? And if it will be bored communicating with us, is that going to be a problem for us as humans, for us as uh, an intelligent beings? Or understanding that this challenge might happen in the future, we can figure out a bridge between us, between the way we think, between the way we communicate, between the way how we absorb and analyze data and learn and evolve to the way that AI technology is going to do similar things. And if we will not build that bridge, we will lose that communication at some point. Because kids, if you think about it, they grow up and eventually they reach to the level of intelligence and communication of those people who were bored to speak with them before. And then they find the right language, the right communication, the right conversations to have. Um, I don't know if we can e that easily grow alongside AI and if AI will grow that way alongside with us. So that's a big Pandora box for me. Um, I don't know if that, I don't know if anyone has a good answer or bad answer. And, and you have two scenarios, right? You have a scenario that says that AI will be bored with us, will find humanity not interesting and will figure out if they need humanity or not, right? Um, or if they don't need, they will just travel somewhere outside of humanity. If they need humanity, they will live with humanity. But then it's a question if we are going to be the pets or companions. And the second option, and I truly hope that that will be the reality, that AI will see and that bridge that we will build between us and that AI um, see in humanity as an important part of their life and will help us to improve, evolve, and be better. And that means that we will have a bright and amazing future for us. We will not have challenges with energy. We will not have challenges with um, anything related to health. We will not think about money. We will not think about food. We will have everything of what we need. Um, to live in prosperity in the best way. And the only thing that we will need to do is then make sure we are happy. So you have really two avenues right now. And I think we still have the power, even though it's a big question mark if we do have, but I hope we do still have the power to navigate into the right avenue for us. Because if we will not do it, I would not trust chances. As a business leader, you're not trusting chances. You're building a strategy, you're building a plan, and you're trying to make sure that plan executed. If you are just hoping for chances, it's not often happen, right? So um, I don't know if that was a bit dark, my this answer. was deep, but this <laughs> but was it, definitely it's a, it's, deep. It's the Pandora box. It's definitely deep. You know what? We we all thinking we're evolving, okay? And the only way to find out, right? It's keep doing things we find important, okay? That's wisdom 
point from Irene today, all right? So Max, I want to thank you so very much because we started with technology. We talked a little bit about people and their roles, right? How they're gonna accomplish things they want to accomplish, right? In their organizations, in their industries, right? And we went into philosophical, very interesting yeah. points. So let's leave our audience, Max, with few takeaways, okay? What do you want to share with the world today with us? We talked about AI here and now, and that was good, I think. I think it was good. So a few points, I mean, to remember this conversation by, if you'd like. The biggest point is uh, all of, to all of those who think that the past were better than it is today or is better than the future coming, you are so wrong. Like 50 years ago, health was not what it is. 100 years ago, we barely had, you know, uh, vaccines. 200 years ago, people were not washing hands and were dying like flies when they reach, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. So we are all living in way better reality than it was for our parents and for their parents. So your first takeaway is that be happy to live today and be excited about the revolution that is happening because you can be part of it. Um, second takeaway, always plan and don't hope for chances. Um, if something is good happening within your plan that you are not expecting, this is great. But if you have no plan, you cannot mitigate the risks in your, in your business, in your life. So you always need to have a risk mitigation plan, a strategy that leads you forward to wherever you want. Um, third is, is actually, a, I think a takeaway that is not mine. I will not take a credit for that, but it's something that helps me uh, a lot. Um, plan for small wins because when you accumulate them, they will create the big wins. Okay. It's very hard to plan a big win in, in the future. If you have small steps with small wins, they will bring you to the right place way faster. Uh, and I will use uh, a, a wisdom that I read in um, science fiction that is actually coming from China, but it's funny. But uh, when you walk slow, you get faster. And the, the wisdom behind it was when you walk slow, you're losing less power. And that means you can see better what is happening around you and you can use your forces way better. And sometimes having those small wins, step by step, step by step, will bring you way faster to the target than if you every time trying just to have the big win. Because the failure of the big win usually is as big as the win as well. So sometimes the small wins are better. Um, and the last one, one of the things that I think is important for us as humans right now is to develop the imagination as much as we can. Because that's the only thing that is usually it is the biggest bottleneck of people, okay? The more imagination you have, the more dreams you can imagine into technology, into the future, into your business, the less bottlenecks of developing those you're going to have. So continue dreaming. That's part of being an entrepreneur. It's part of being an innovator. Thank you. Thank you, Max, so very much. Thank you. I had an enormously great time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Same here. Thank you.